we'll get ourselves going. So welcome everyone uh, to our second NAC Ask Me Anything for Fall 2023. Uh, my name is Susan Bogus, and I am an NAC member and interim chair and AGC endowed chair professor of construction engineering and management at the University of New Mexico. My co-moderator who will be joining us shortly is NAC member Virchen Besserich Gerber. Virchen is a professor and department chair of the Astani Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Southern California. The theme for this semester is the implementation of new technology in designing construction. This is a great opportunity to ask questions about the use of AI, robotics, modularization, digital twins, and other technologies being employed, and also to get career advice from these very successful professionals. Just a little bit about the National Academy of Construction. The National Academy of Construction was established in 1999 to recognize our industry leaders. An important purpose of the Academy is to share the collective knowledge and experience of our members to improve the industry. We have established the NAC, Ask Me Anything, to help transfer knowledge of our members to our next generation of construction leaders. And so this webinar provides means to link past and present participants in the construction industry. Our Ask Me Anything sponsors this year are the University of Florida, Rinker School of Construction, Arizona State University, Dell E. Webb School of Construction, and the University of Colorado at Boulder Construction Engineering and Management Program. The format for this webinar is simple. Our speaker will make a short presentation and then we will follow it up with, I will ask questions uh, that you all have submitted. If you have not already submitted a question, you still have time to do so, please email your questions to nacama at austin.utexas.edu. One student who submits a question will win a $500 scholarship, which will be announced at the end of this event. Now let me introduce our speaker for tonight. Carl Haas is a university research chair at the University of Waterloo in Canada. He has a bachelor's degree in systems design engineering from Waterloo and graduate degrees from Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh in civil engineering. He has experience in modularization, supply chain management, construction productivity, craft training, and digital digitalization of design and construction processes. His broader research interests include AI, human robotic systems, and the circular economy in the built environment. Numerous industry and government partnerships support his research. He serves as an advisor to several startups and participates in the Creative Destruction Lab at the Rotman School of Management. As the chair of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Waterloo, between, between 2017 and 2022, he led rapid growth and renewal of staff, faculty, students, and physical plant, including a new architectural engineering undergraduate program launched in 2018. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a member of the National Academy of Construction. In 2019, he received the ASCE Computing and Civil Engineering Award, and in 2021, he received the U.S. Construction Industry Institute's James B. Porter Jr. Award for Technology Leadership. Welcome, Dr. Haas, to Ask Me Anything. Uh, perhaps you could start out with a brief presentation on technology and construction, and then we'll go into some of the questions that the students have asked. Thank you, Dr. Bogus, and uh, uh, welcome everyone tonight. I will just share a real brief uh, introductory presentation, and it is, uh, the intent here is just to kind of sample a few of the things that I've been working on over the years, and um, not in any way thorough. So, uh, you know, some of the areas that you might have seen on the website when you looked up the list, uh, some of the things I work on with my colleagues, uh, one of them is uh, an area that I've been working on gosh, since the 80s. So uh, maybe please don't do the math on that. But mobile robots for various purposes, including scan to 
building information modeling. And um, we're all uh, familiar with the Spot robot by Boston Dynamics. Um, the little one we have on the left there is ClearPath. Uh, those are robots made in Waterloo. And we put some uh, sensors on them and use the robotic operating system to go out and do uh, scanning and things called SLAM. And we get uh, uh, images and, and point clouds. And then we, uh, this is an image in a point cloud of a um, nuclear reactor mock-up that we work on and coincidentally are building digital twins for. And then we uh, try to turn that into a BIM at some point so that we can play around with that for various purposes, quantity takeoffs, uh, planning for operations. Um, and actually we do a little bit of what's called um, reality data capture and, and take some of that information and put it in augmented reality or virtual reality. And in my case, I don't focus so much on training, but more on planning and design and the crafts. For example, uh, we have uh, sorts of things where you can go into that virtual reality environment and take apart steel and concrete and wood structures and put them in back together again in interesting combinations. Uh, I'm just showing you one of the uh, workshops that we did re very recently. Uh, all the way to doing things like augmented reality in, in uh, fabrication facilities where you might have fabricated something a couple thousand miles away and you wanna see if it's gonna fit um, in another uh, piece of piping and instrumentation where you're in your own shop and you know you can use augmented reality to help visualize that and, and check that fit. Um, and we have been using AI over the years for uh, many different things. We've been through a lot of uh, waves of AI. A couple of things we use it for uh, lately are uh, 3D object finding and uh, generative or computational design. So with the object finding, uh, the idea is that you're looking for the chair or the uh, piece of equipment in a scene, not just chairs or, or people or, or backhoes, right? And so that is a bit of a challenge. And if you can do that, it's good for asset management or for robotics or for other sorts of things. Um, so we have a method for doing that. Um, and just showing you that, you know, and, and this is a kind of the rendering looks kind of crude, but it's a, it's called a point cloud. And we placed two of these objects in a scene and just, you know, identifying that you could find these uh, these waste shoots, uh, but really you'd just mostly be looking for one particular waste shoot and we can do that. And then we use AI for things like uh, computational and generative design. In this case, we were looking at adding modules on the outside of a um, mid-rise residential unit and uh, to do something called adaptive reuse and we were looking at what the impact of hundreds of combinations of designs would be on energy use and daylighting and stuff. Use things like physics plugins into BIM to figure that out. But overall, top of it all is an AI tool. Um, and then uh, a lot of time over the years, I've worked on modularization and in, uh, industrial and residential. And, you know, the sort of thing nowadays, you can build these things with a incredible quality. You do steel, concrete, wood modules. And there can be a lot of flexibility in how you configure them as well. And that's, that's kind of fun too. We dropped this particular module in the backyard of a 1950s home uh, to create that thing on the top right. And, and it was a nice way of putting a little tiny home in, in somebody's backyard. Um, and so coming full circle, uh, you know, where how does that connect to uh, robotics? The bottom right is that icon uh, printer that uh, it's a company set up in Austin. They're uh, printing houses and they're even printing uh, uh, facilities for uh, living on Mars. Um, so, you know, what are we going to do with robotics? Are we going to bring the factory to the site? Are we going to roboticize the, the modular factory? Or are we going to have mobile robots like uh, autonomous haul vehicles? Uh, it's uh, the future is incredible. And I just threw in some robots that we worked on in the 90s, uh, kind of almost like antiques now looking at them, but the, the ones on the left and the top are things we worked on back then. That was all I wanted to show you just to kind of get the conversation going. And I know there will be lots of questions. So thank you for coming. Great. Thanks, Carl. 
Uh, so uh, the students have uh, emailed in many, many questions. We won't be able to get to all of them. Um, and I might combine some of them. So if you don't hear your exact question, I might be combining it with others. Um, but let's start with some uh, technology questions. And then I thought maybe later in the session, we could move to some career questions. Sure. Um, so uh, the first question deals with how, um, what are some examples of how technologies such as as robotics um, and other uh, digital twins and things like that, how um, are you seeing them mostly implemented on construction sites? Um, mm -hmm. Or how do you, where do you see there being opportunities for this to be growing on construction sites? Okay, yeah, I'll just maybe start with robotics. So, um, you know, the, the, what seemed pretty easy back in the 80s of building a you know masonry robot turned out to be a lot harder because you had to work with uh, you know the squishy kind of mortar which robots don't work with very well but but um pretty quickly uh, we had um autonomous haul vehicles on uh mine sites um and we had uh semi-automated um uh, scrapers, uh, dozers, backhoes, working way back even in the 90s and being sold by Caterpillar and Komatsu, John Deere. Um, so we've already seen robots getting deployed uh, with varying degrees of automation. But you know, even if you have isometrics in front of an operator, if, if the blade is being controlled automatically, that's essentially using robotics in the background. Um, and in some cases, improving productivity 50%. And now where you see robots maybe, you know, is uh, something like uh, an inspection uh, robot like Spot running around the site, um, getting all sorts of information. And that's feeding in a little bit into the digital twins that you asked about, Dr. Bogus, where if you can get information about a site at a pretty high frequency, so maybe every hour or every day, you can feed your uh models, your control models for schedule and cost and quality uh, for that project. And you've essentially got a digital twin because that fits the definition of a digital twin where you've got the, the sensing on the site, you've got the uh, model that you can simulate the project's behavior with, uh, you know, a short look aheads, um, and you've got that kind of feedback loop and you're, and you're using that to anticipate what's going to happen on your project. And just a quick example, if you use productivity factor, you know, right now we already use that to, you know, have some idea of whether you're going to go off the rails for, for cost and schedule. And, um, and we're already using, we have been for a long time, uh, schedule and cost controls in a digital twin way, maybe not in a way that uh, look fancy, but it's definitely a digital twin by definition. Great. Thank okay. you. Um, Next question I have is uh, related to safety, specifically safety. Mm. Um, what innovative safety measures uh, can construction companies adopt to reduce risks and enhance worker safety? Wow, that is a that is a great question. I've struggled with that, uh, and many of my colleagues have for decades. Um, you know the. I th there's a, a safety or safety control tr uh, pyramid that people talk about. And um, you first, you kind of want to change behavior. You want to engineer out risk, and then you want to try to uh, uh, change behavior. You want to do things like that. But where, where does technology figure in? I think it comes in, in some ways, uh, proximity detectors on heavy equipment. So if you're trying to one of the big uh, sources of um, injury is crushing. Um, so if you have proximity detectors on the equipment uh, and or you have mutual proximity detectors between craft workers uh, and the equipment using a, something called like RFID tags or GPIS and you have alarms, that's, that's one way of improving safety. Uh, some people thought about improving safety by having uh, automated inspection and I, I think that might work using AI to you know check if people are wearing their hard hats or uh, in the wrong areas. I'm a little hesitant 
to use that kind of thing because it, it may not respect the privacy and the dignity of the worker. Uh, and, you know, I know there's a trade-off between that and their safety, but we got to think hard about that. And then maybe there's a little bit of around technology being used for um, health and safety. So where we put such a, you know, we may be having a safe site, but, you know, over time people are becoming essentially crippled or worn out because of uh, musculoskeletal disorders, basically cumulative load on their joints from running, you know, impact equipment and making, you know, and heavy loads and so on. And if we can help them track uh, the load on their joints and track their fatigue and things like that and using wearables, um, and then they can adapt their own behavior to to not overload themselves. That would be pretty cool. Or to adapt their own behavior to you know lift more carefully or more ergonomically, um, or even use exoskeletons to take loads off their joints. Maybe that can be a, a safety and health improvement too. So that's just a sample. I don't. But those are some areas where 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 technology is is impacting health and safety. I think, Dr. Bogus. All right. Thanks. Um, moving on now, the, the the buzzword that we're all talking about, artificial intelligence, right? Um, <laughs> how have you seen AI being integrated into everyday work of typical engineering or construction processes? Wow, that is a really good question. I, I'm trying to think back to what would have been the very earliest uh, actual implementation of AI. Uh, and I could be biased, but I think uh, a, uh, the AI that was using being used to identify uh, objects in scans of the site uh, so that you could automate um, progress tracking uh, or you could automate uh, quality control, um, that was some pretty early AI, and that that became part of some tools that are being deployed by different people. Um, there's AI that's I think being deployed for um, well, actually, it was safety, and I should have thought of that. But uh, when you want to do ergonomic analysis of people, you want to see if they're exceeding uh, safety limits. You can uh, use a, a cell phone camera. And then there are AI tools that can estimate the pose uh, at points in time of the worker. And that can tell you whether uh, uh, joint angles and so on are being exceeded uh, for types of work. And it can automatically give you something called a ruler or a rebo score. And that, that's definitely using AI. Um, it, it, more, I, th I think in the future, we're gonna see AI um, being used to uh, control robots. Uh, I spent 30 years trying to figure out how to control robots using classical inverse kinematics and dynamics and control. And my understanding now um, is that we can train a network uh, to uh, control a robot to run, walk, dig efficiently and stay and in a stable way. We don't even need to really understand how it's working. Um, we just need to train it um, to do those things, which uh, kind of blows my mind. Um, and then the other places where we've seen AI is um, inspection uh, for quality control and condition assessment. So, and, and a lot of that's the sort of the computer vision type of AI. I, I haven't seen the large language models being employed, I guess some some companies are said to have been using AI to do things like uh, anticipate um, projects uh, or project health. So um, they have AI engines looking at leading indicators on a project. And in theory, the AI can tell you for a really big project if it's not going to be going well in a month or two. Uh, and it's using essentially a kind of an estimator or a pattern recognition tool. So um, I, I know I did not exhaust the applications, but those are some places AI is being implemented. Fascinating. <laughs> uh, so our next question talks about um, challenges. 
Mm. And so um, what would you say is the most difficult or, or challenging part of integrating technology such as robotics? Mm. Okay. Well, so many challenging parts. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, where to begin? The When you disrupt a process uh, that everybody is used to executing uh, on a project, you know, a way of moving materials, a way of um, pro tracking progress, a way of, uh, of actually doing the work. Um, that is incredibly uh, challenging to implement. People do not like to have their, their processes disrupted uh, and for good reason, because there's all sorts of ripple effects. So when you think you're going to automate a process in a construction project, you often get in trouble. Uh, um, another challenge is when you, um, you might have a better way of doing something in theory, it might save time and money, but in, it turns out it requires more training and it's more complex. And it sounds great to an engineer but it's not gonna get used because it doesn't make the worker's life easier or the, their job easier. Um, it's not simple and it's not easy to use. And, and I think that's actually pretty reasonable because that's how we evaluate apps in our own life and things in our own life. So I, I think it's reasonable that if you're making things more complicated for people, then um, whether it's a craft worker or whether it's uh, the project manager, they're, they're not gonna tend to implement things like that. And then uh, any sort of technology that uh, requires having um, some sort of uh, code changed, so some sort of um, maintenance uh, requirement at the, uh, you know, or building code changed uh, to accept it is, is a huge challenge. Anything that doesn't communicate using standard formats, there are just so many ways to tank a technology in a project and, and the things that do get adopted are the things that can typically work in isolation or work in the background, you know, as a background thing, like uh, somebody automating a punch list for, for uh, you know, small contractors on housing projects using cell phones. Man, that's fantastic. Just makes your job easier, works in the background, doesn't disrupt anything. So, the, you know, there's some things that just work great and there's some things that, that, man, you can really get in trouble. That in my experience, because I have uh, had a few successes and I've had some uh, real failures that really hurt. Um, so maybe sticking with the challenge, um, yeah. maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about um, what we hear and, and a lot about, which is the sort of resistance to change amongst especially maybe older or or more traditional contractors to adopting new technologies. Hmm. Um, how do you overcome a challenge like that? Yeah, you know, I think that's really interesting because I, I hear it all the time and I know that psychologically I resist change. Um, you know, I train myself to try to be open to change, but but man, I don't, I don't want to do some workflow differently at work. I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to have to go through customs in a different way. So I think it's natural to resist change. Um, to overcome it, there's a couple, you know, there's the pull and the push. The pull would be, wow, it's just so cool. It makes their job easier and simpler and just goes smoother. And, you know, word of mouth, it just people want that that tool. And you've seen stuff get adopted on sites that, you know, that, that have those sorts of characteristics. Um, so... That, you know, that that helps uh, get it, uh, overcome the resistance to change. And then I think there's a role for leadership too. And uh, I've spent a lot of time in Germany and Switzerland and kind of seen their approach. And sometimes the leadership is just a little bit more persistent, a little bit more patient in terms of training. And, you know, and they just sort of communicate that this, this is gonna be the way it's gonna be done. Um, but again, I think like I think resistance to change, frankly, is legitimate if if you're a project manager and you've already got 
27 different workflows and now somebody wants to add a workflow, but you don't have any more hours in a day. I mean, it's, it's pretty reasonable to ask, well, so what am I going to do less? Right. And, and so you've got to be able to kind of help them with that or, or say, well, actually it's going to take less time to do what you're already doing. Um, those are, <laughs> mm -hmm. those are, there's sort of been my experience with change and implementing technology. Okay. Um, this question has to do with a technology that's maybe been around a little while, but not widely used in the, at least in the U.S. I, I guess I'm not sure about Canada, but why do you think modular uh, construction is not used more widely? Well, that is such a good question because I, I just saw something today that was showing that, and, I, and it's been my experience working in Sweden and, and, and Denmark that, you know, it's like, 40% of the uh, residential market is modular now. And it's like 3% in the US. It's the lowest anywhere uh, in the world, as far as I can tell, in the in the uh, uh, advanced economic countries. Um, <clears throat> so why isn't it being used? Um, I, 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 I think that was the question, right? Why isn't it being used? Um, I think, uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, one is there's a still ha a historical resistance to the concept of growing up and living in a double wide or you know or a, a motor you know a, 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 a mobile home, and people associate modular with mobile homes. Um, so there's a, a class issue, um, and you know the the memory of somebody living in Sweden is that, you know, that modular residential units of, of low rise residential units are high quality, architecturally beautiful and really cool and funky to live in, right? So it's it's just a different vibe. Um, so I don't think we've, we've had the, uh, we, we haven't historically uh, had the great designs. We haven't historically uh, done modular in a, in a high quality way, which it absolutely can be done. It can be higher quality than stick build. Um, we have an industry that's incredibly fragmented. So a lot of homes being built by individual home builders and, you know, you, you bring on a, a, a framing crew, uh, you bring on, you know, you're just, you're just bringing these people on as you find them on the street almost, or you find them in your cell phone and you just mobilize the resources and stick build your home. And it, it, in the end, it, it's a pretty nice home. And, and you know, it's pretty, it looks pretty unique. And that's the other challenge with modularization in the U.S. where we want to be, we're all individualists. We want to, we want to have that unique looking home. And, you know, it's really hard to implement mass customization with modular, but it can be done, but it's harder. And, and other cultures are okay with being in a very cool development. Um, the other, I think, resistance is um, we have really cheap labor in the U.S., very, very cheap labor. And um, modular makes more sense if you do it in a factory and you invest a lot in uh, capital and, I mean, robotics and, and, and so on. Um, so it starts looking more productive and like a, a cheaper and better and higher quality alternative if you can automate it but we tend not to automate because labor is so cheap in the U.S. relatively to some of these other countries. And then maybe one of the last things is, it's just the housing industry and the construction industry in general. It's um, cyclical. You know, it, it, the economy might go up and down a little bit. You know, different industries might go up and down a couple percent, you know, from depression to, you know, or from recession to, to you know, to the peak performance. But the construction industry, will dip 50% in terms of activity. And if you've invested $100 million in a modular plant and housing basically bottoms out and yeah, you, you can't keep that plant active, you can't make that capital work for you, you go bankrupt. So, you know, so it's, it's I think a little bit the, the capital investment in, in the plant to make modules as well. So it's just a whole bunch of those things. I, I'm, I think the future is bright, though, with BIM and with 3D imaging and all sorts of things. I, I think modular, it's growing exponentially, growing 5 or 10% compound annual growth a year. And off-site fab uh, growing just as fast, you know, bathroom units, cabinetry, stuff like that. So I think the future is it's going to just increase hugely in the U.S. 
Okay, great. So um, several people asked this question. It's, it's yeah. a, or a similar question. And this is kind of a, a big open-ended question, but it has to do with <clears throat> um, what technologies that you've either been associated with that you've researched or that you've been a part of that you think have been most influential on oh. the <laughs> industry? Uh, sorry. So ones that I've been associated with that have been successes. I can, maybe I'll finish up with the failures. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so for technologies, I think the uh, actually the construction robots, the stuff we did in the 90s, I think we had some influence on the big companies like Caterpillar, but, you know, it moved very quickly and, and they maybe took some of, or uh, uh, adopted some of our ideas and made money on that. And that was great. Um, and turned, you know, and, and took over parts of the earth moving and other sorts of uh, business. Um, we, uh, I think we made some progress with materials tracking. So we did some uh, work uh, on uh, being able to track materials in 2D and 3D um, in real time. And we came up with some of the very first algorithms where you might have uh, GPS enabled readers and you could track the tags that were on materials. And that had a great impact on projects where um, you don't, you, you take less time finding things, so you improve productivity, but even more so you reduce risk of losing really important items that will set you back on the project um, if you lose them like a you know, $50,000 valve or something that you can't easily procure and will shut your project down. So the uh, materials tracking um, that we contributed to is commercial now. I think the... Um, Condition, automated condition assessment, automated scan to BIM, uh, a lot of the algorithms that we uh, contributed to or, or published, and, and with colleagues, the, these were busy areas, but, you know, it, it, personally, I contributed as well to those areas in, in the early days. Um, those are algorithms now that exist as, you know, um, drop-down menus on, on a lot of those uh, uh, commercial software packages. Um, trying to think what else we, that we've worked on that's uh, been a success um, and that has been implemented. Um, you know, that may be enough for now, but I, I think there might be more. <laughs> but my memory is failing me right now, uh, Dr. Bogus. And, uh, and that, we've worked on some failures too, by the way. So, or at least there were failures in our business startups, but other people made money and succeeded in those areas. So maybe they weren't failures from a technology perspective. Oh, uh, I see your computer must have uh, ran out of juice and now I, you're on your cell phone. Well, okay. I think I'm back here. Sorry about that. Oh, no, I have yeah. unstable connection here, of yeah. course. <laughs> um, can you, can you hear me? I, I, I sure can. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yep. Uh, I, I came back just in time to ask my next question. Sure. <laughs> um, and this has to do with uh, um, uh, career issues. And so and I've got several people ask career related, what I categorized as career related questions. So here's one that says, what key skill sets and knowledge areas do you believe will be most critical for people entering the design and construction industry in the future? Oh, that's a really good question. So design and construction. I mean, basically in yeah. light of, you know, yeah. potential growth in, in technologies and changes in yeah. development in technologies. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think that your um, ability to communicate is absolutely critical both verbally and in terms of written communication uh, at a scale bigger than a tweet, right? So being able to, at the very least, do good uh, PowerPoint presentations, but to be able to uh, put together a, a good sales pitch or report or explanation um, for uh, proposed change. Uh, so the ability to communicate, huge. Um, Ability to absorb um, new technologies and not necessarily understand them in great depth, but be able to use them effectively. So 
to be able to just understand it enough at a deep enough level um, that you could, uh, for example, be a prompt engineer for AI as opposed to an, a person who uh, does transfer learning for AI or does, you know, um, trains AIs for particular companies. That's that's going to require a deeper level of skill, but but we would have the level of skill to to be able to effectively use these tools because they're getting just easier and easier to use. But you know, to be able to use them and learn new tools and not be afraid of learning new tools. So so communications, some level of technical depth. Um, I would uh, other skills that are important. I don't know if it's a skill, but a capacity to uh, adapt to change. Um, so to be nimble, um, to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, open to change is really important. The um, think of other uh, factors that will help you be a success. I think, I don't know if it's a skill set, but you can, you can, you can uh, work on it. You can uh, curate this in your own uh, character. Uh, but curiosity, I think there's going to be, uh, so to be a, uh, a person who reads widely, who tries to understand different ways of thinking, different philosophies, uh, doesn't get trapped in uh, comfort zones and, and paradigms and, and easy uh, solutions. So I think that you, if you can stay curious, read wildly different sources, um, and that way be an integrator and see where the, the really great opportunities are, that's going to help you in this crazy, quickly changing world ahead. Um, and be numerate, uh, be able to um, call um, the, uh, I'm trying to think of a nice way of putting it, the, the uh, fabrications and the nonsense out of the media um, you know, by looking for different sources and cross-checking and so on. Um, that, I know that didn't sound very technical, but I think you still need some technical foundation and be able to, you know, do some calculations in your head, uh, be able to understand uh, rates of change and magnitudes, you know, read how the world really works by Vaclav Schmiel. Just, you know, get some basics so that you know how big the American economy is you know, is it two billion or is it 20 trillion? You really need to know that kind of stuff, how big the construction industry is um, to know whether people are, are uh, spinning you a, a, a tail. So, wow, that was a, I don't know if that was a mm -hmm. recipe, Dr. Bogus, but that was just some ideas. Great, thanks. Um, so this question, um, mm. you know, recognizes that you, uh, mentored many students, but what strategies have you found most effective in nurturing and guiding the next generation of researchers and, and professionals in such a, a, a changing field? Wow, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I guess I've, I certainly, you know, I've, I've taught undergraduate courses and I think on one hand, you wanna uh, feel like you've gained some skills and some mastery uh, uh, over uh, certain, you know, being able to do some things, you know, so we want to teach you how to use Microsoft Project and estimating tools and so on. But more, I think even more importantly for you to be successful in the future, I've got to uh, help you learn how to think uh, for yourself, uh, how to uh, how to understand underlying principles and, and so on, and to be able to, um, Imagine a solution to a problem, to have some vision for a path forward as opposed to being told what to do. So that, that would be the undergraduate level of, of training. At the graduate level for uh, doctoral students, uh, I really push very, very hard for them to uh, try to come up with the solution themselves, to make decisions themselves about path forward, um, to uh, learn how to prioritize by themselves, um, to seek you know, all sorts of input from the literature, from other experts, and to not get stuck um, 
in the uh, ivory tower or in our, you know, in the office uh, cubicle, but to get out and uh, meet people, to get out to, you know, to events in different countries, to get out to construction sites, to get out to factory floors, just to to figure out what are the what's going on in the industry, what are the problems. Um, so yeah, those uh, being able to write uh, huge huge uh, challenge uh, today is to help people learn how to uh, write effectively because in the end, if you're making a pitch for a startup, um, if you're trying to uh, pitch a new program to your boss or to the executive leadership, uh, if you're trying to defend your, your PhD thesis, um, you have to be able to write well and communicate uh, some concepts that are in a structured and good and an effective way. Great. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a um, lot. That's great. Um, so this uh, next one uh, address uh, has a question mm -hmm. about work-life balance. It's often talked about in, in the industry. Yeah. yeah. And um, and this person's wondering about whether uh, becoming a, a parent affected your perspectives mm. on the industry and in terms of the way you mentor and guide younger professionals. Yeah, that's a really good question because uh, you might have guessed I'm a member of the baby boomer generation and uh, there have been some observations that those people are workaholics. And uh, I know that I spent my 30s working about 70 hours a week. And I will be frank in hindsight, I don't think I was very effective. Um, uh, and all the science and statistics tell us that uh, that kind of work macho approach is, is not effective. When I did have children uh, in my late 30s and early 40s, I was forced to work fewer hours to share the load with my professional spouse. And uh, I was shocked that I think I was more effective. I think my effectiveness and my productivity might have actually gone up. And it was an important lesson to learn that, you know, getting sleep, uh, eating well, uh, working out an hour a day, staying, you know, staying fit, um, staying healthy and having balance uh, with your, your health, your job, your family, your, uh, your religion, you know, is incredibly important to, you know, uh, have an impact in the end, but um, and then you, you you can keep going. You feel great. So yeah, so I do think that uh, the new you know the youngest generation, uh, my generation uh, complains that they don't have a work ethic, but I think they uh, my you know it's not like they're doing nothing. They're busy. They're curious. Um, they're maybe putting in less hours at work, and yet they're getting a lot done. And I think that's actually very healthy and that's just fine. You know, maybe uh, let's spend more time on quality of life and less on consumption and, and getting, you know, making money. And that, that'd be really good. Um, also, I've seen working in Europe that a uh, really good, hard 35, 40 hour week, 40 hour week, uh, man, that, that, those are uh, happy, uh, healthy countries, a lot of those countries, and, and they're getting a lot done. So, yeah, so I don't, uh, I think that was about balance, the original question, Dr. Bogus. And uh, yeah, I think balance in the end is absolutely critical and even gets you through some of the roughest periods better than, than going all out, you know, 24 seven. All right. So just to, to wrap up one last question yeah. here, maybe just give a short, you know, uh, uh, um, answer here, but what advice would you give a college age version of yourself. If you if you had it, mm. you know, basically going back to college, you were back in your twenties or whatever. What advice would you give yourself? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, uh, so, advice I would give myself. I I think um, have more courage. <clears throat> I think I was pretty risk averse uh, in many ways. And it may be, you know, partly that's character, partly it's the way you grow up if you didn't grow up with uh, a lot of uh, money. Um, but I think uh, to take risks in terms of uh, the sorts of activities that you engage in, the sorts of, uh, you know, whether you 
uh, decide to borrow money to go to business school and do an MBA, um, uh, to do a startup in your 20s, you know, don't wait uh, because the best time to do a startup is in your 20s. It doesn't matter if you fail, you will fail. But you, you know, you can fail two or three times and it's just like getting two or three degrees and eventually you're going to succeed. And, you know, so I would say just uh, more courage, um, uh, less risk averse, um, you know, uh, try new and interesting things. And, and in hindsight, I did a lot of that stuff. I traveled and I did some things, but I wish I'd been even more uh, aggressive and real and even more open and even more uh risk tolerant. I don't mean like skydiving. I mean, in, in terms of uh, <laughs> life's opportunities. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, well, yeah. There's probably lots of other things I could have done better too. I don't know. I think that's a great, that's a great uh, end to our questions. Uh, we had many more questions, not enough time hmm. for all the questions, but, but I really want to thank you for your time. We also have a winner of our scholarship. And so, uh, Inbei Chung from the University of Texas at Austin was selected as our uh, winner today for uh, the scholarship as one of the students who uh, asked a question or submitted a question for our uh, Ask Me Anything. Um, so uh, with that, though, uh, before oh, we sorry. say good night. Hook, hook them horns, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, you, I tell you. Uh, but before we say goodnight, we would like to say a special thank you to our sponsors. So we had sponsorships from the University of Florida Riker School of Construction, Arizona State University, Delhi Webb School of Construction. Uh-oh, Dr. Bogus, you froze on us. I don't know if you froze on everybody. Delhi Webb School of Construction in uh, um, Tempe, Arizona. That's uh, in... Uh, Arizona State. Man, Dr. Bogus. Well, yeah. well okay. uh, Carla, I have been here, so I'll I'll take over. Um, I think we lost Susan. Well, it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Dr. Dr. Besser Gerber, nice to nice to hear from you. <laughs> nice to see you as well. I've been silently listening and I learned a lot from uh, you, Carl. It's uh, it was amazing. Thank you so much for your time and uh, and and the candid conversation. I'll pass it back to Susan if she's back. Please, yeah. I, if if you can hear me again, I was I was just going to end with saying that our next webinar is November fourteenth. So please please join us and submit your questions. Uh, that's great. Yeah, I enjoyed that. So uh, and uh, so. So Carl, I, thank you very much for your time and your insights. Uh, well, uh, you're you're welcome, and uh, boy, uh, you know I just say, all the students here know I read all of the literature of the two doctors here and learn a lot from them as well. I know them quite well. <laughs> so, oh, uh, you are so kind. Um, thanks very much. So, uh, time to hang up, is it? Okay. Yes. <laughs> have a good night. Thank have a good you. night, everybody. Bye bye. Good night. <laughs>